So that's where I've been the last nine days or so. So uh, we're back now and ready to finish out this uh, series of Life, Money, Hope. And I've been looking forward to this series and to this sermon in particular since we planned this series clear back to the first of the year. Uh, this, this is one of the most exciting principles of the Christian for life for me. It's the principle of first. And I just want to tell you, if you can get a handle on this principle, it will make a profound difference in your life, money, and hope. It's just, this principle, it's been woefully miscommunicated in the church. And, and I think it's been woefully miscommunicated because it's so powerful. And because it's so powerful, the enemies of God, the world, our own flesh, and the devil fight hard against this principle. They try to confound and confuse us on it. And so I really need for you today to, to put on your listening ears and to open your heart and mind to the, what the Word of God has to say. Just set aside the misconceptions, maybe even the own, your own resistance that's built up, maybe without you even knowing it. Because this principle will set you free. Uh, I want to start with a, a passage in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 13. Uh, verses 1 and 2 uh, say this. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me every firstborn male. Consecrate means to set apart, dedicate, in some instances even to sacrifice to me the firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me. Circle that phrase, belongs to me whether man or animal. And God early on set the, the principle that if you want to have a right relationship with God, you've got to consecrate, set apart, dedicate, maybe even sacrifice the first. The firstborn of every offspring, whether man or animal. And then down in verses 12 and 13, he says, how many of you own a donkey? Okay, we got one. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> And uh, so I'm going to need to explain this culturally to you, okay? Uh, verse 12 and 13, he says, You are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey. But if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. Now, there's two concepts here that I want you to get. First is, there are some things that you can give, consecrate, dedicate, sacrifice to the Lord. And there are some things that you have to redeem. Because in God's economy, there are clean things and there are unclean things. And if you have something that's clean, you can just offer that straight to God. God will accept your offering. But if you have something that is unclean, you can't offer that to God. Because God won't accept anything that's unclean. And so you have to find a clean thing to redeem the unclean thing. Clean things can be sacrificed to God and God will accept them. Unclean things have to be redeemed with something that's clean. And a donkey was an unclean thing. Uh, you, you, you couldn't offer a donkey to God. You had to take a clean thing like a lamb and offer it to God to redeem the donkey. And if you weren't willing to offer the lamb for the donkey, then you're required to break the neck of the donkey. Because if you won't redeem it, you don't get to keep it. Okay? If you won't redeem it, you don't get because it belongs to God. It's not yours. Now, that's how important... The concept of God's sovereign holiness is. This isn't just a matter of preference of God, that God likes sheep more than he likes donkeys. This is a matter of holiness. It's a matter of purity versus sinfulness. It's an illustration of how dreadful, how damaging sin is. Sin costs lives. The wages of sin is death. And this principle goes way beyond sheep and donkeys. I mean, it cuts right to the very heart of our salvation process. When Jesus Christ came to earth, was he clean or unclean? And that's not a trick question. I, I really want you to answer that. Was, was Jesus clean or unclean? Clean. clean, exactly. When you and I came to earth, were we clean or unclean? Unclean, unclean exactly. I mean, we showed up broken by, 
by sin. Jesus was clean, which means he qualifies as something that could be directly offered to God. He was the perfect, spotless lamb of God. We were unclean, which means we could never redeem ourselves. There's no way that we could ever be good enough or work hard enough or do enough. I mean, a donkey is unclean because of his donkey nature, not because he hasn't worked hard enough or done enough, just by his very nature. Same is true with us. By our very nature, we're unclean. We have to be redeemed by something. Something clean has to be offered in our place, specifically Jesus Christ. Now, there are a couple of truths in this little discourse that that people often miss regarding the principle of the first. And one of the principles is that God wants you to give him first things. In fact, they belong to him already. So God wants you to take the first things in your life and he either wants you to sacrifice them to him as an act of consecration or he wants you to redeem it. But God wants you to give him first things. But often what we have in our life, those things are unclean, including our money and our stuff. That's why it's called filthy lucre. And so we need to understand that whenever you give, it's not just a matter of giving a portion of it. It's not just a matter of giving a tithe, a tenth of it. You know, a tithe is a tenth apart. But it's not just about the amount. It's about the order. It's got to be given first. God wants the first part because the first part cleans up the rest of it. And if you consecrate the first part of it to God, it's got the ability to redeem the rest. Now people will say, oh pastor, this is an Old Testament law. We're not under the law anymore. We're under grace, so we don't have to worry about this. But the principle of first supersedes the law. I mean, 2,500 years before the law, in Genesis chapter 4, I mean, from the very beginning, God established the principle of the first. Uh, Adam and Eve had two sons, Abel and Cain. Uh, It says, now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. One was a herdsman, one was a farmer, both honorable professions. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Over time, Cain amassed some fruit. He brought some of it to the Lord. But there's a distinction. Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. What's the distinction between these two offerings? Well, one of them's a fruit offering, one's a fat offering. One of them is a grain offering, one's a blood offering. That's not the distinction that got Abel favor and Cain disfavor. Because in other passages of Scripture, we're told it's perfectly fine to bring fruits, perfectly fine to bring grain, bring out of your agricultural produce. It's an an acceptable offering unto God. So what made the distinction between these two offerings? Well, Abel brought his offering from the firstborn of his flock, and Cain didn't. He didn't bring the first fruits. He just brought some fruit that he'd gathered in the process of time. But Abel brought from the first. It's the principle of the first. God doesn't want just some of your stuff. God doesn't just want a tenth of your stuff, a tithe. God wants the first of your stuff because the first belongs to him and it redeems the rest. Now, tithing is not taking ten things and you pick one out and you give it to God because God's not trying to tax you with the tithe. You know, we, we think it's all about the percentage deal where God just wants a tenth of your stuff. But but no, God wants the first, the first 10%, the first of everything. See the difference? Even though Cain and Abel both gave the same percentage of their fruits, God accepted Abel's and he rejected Cain's because while Cain gave some, Abel gave the first. It's the principle of first things first. And I'm going to give you three principles. If you can get these three principles into your life, you're going to see God's favor. Number one is God must be first. 
God cannot be in uh, any other position in your life other than number one. God must be first. He cannot be number two or number three or just on the list. We see that in the first commandment of the Ten Commandments. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods, what? Before me. God says, i got to be in first place. I mean, that's what makes him your God. That's what makes him uh, your Lord. You know, God doesn't mind us having other interests and activities. He just wants to be first. God doesn't mind us having lunch appointments. He just wants us to pray first when we have them. You know, God, God doesn't mind us having a day full of activities. He just wants the first activity out of the day to be us focusing on our relationship with him. God doesn't mind us going to the doctor. He just wants us to pray to him first before we go. See what he'll do. Now, why does God want to have first place? Because he's jealous. He's jealous. And when God looks down at you, he doesn't see a bunch of knot-headed earthlings that he's got to slap around and try and get them good enough to get into his heaven. No, he looks down at you and me and he sees people that he wants to have a love relationship with. And he is willing to go to extreme measures, the sacrificing of his firstborn son, in order to establish that relationship with us. But you've got to make him number one in your life in order for it to work. It says, do not follow other gods. And I'm going to change the word gods to loves because it will resonate better with us in our culture. Do not follow other loves, the loves of the peoples around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God. And when we see that at first we think, oh my, God's got a character flaw. He's jealous. But the truth is, in our relationships, we're jealous as well. I mean, if we have a relationship that's important to us, we want that relationship to bear the same importance in the life of the other person. I mean, I've been ma- married to my wife, Katie, for 42 years. And imagine if I went to her and said, Honey, there are 7 billion people on the planet. Half of them are men, half of them are women. And of the 3.5 billion other women on the planet, Honey, I just want you to know that you are number two. <laughs> that is not going to fly. Okay? It's just not. Even though there are 3,999,999,998 women behind her. No. Being number two is just not going to work. And that's the way God feels about you. Number two is just not going to work. God must be first. Principle number two. We put God first... By giving him the first of everything. And I know that won't fit in your little line there on your notes, so just make it work. Okay? If you want to let God know that he's first, then you give him the first of everything. And it's not just a money principle. You know, we've kind of skewed this to money, and that's what's confused us, and it's robbed us of the power of this principle. But what needs to happen is you need to take everything in your life and, and give God the first. Uh, Prayer, for instance. You know, prayer is a wonderful thing. You should pray all day long. Paul tells us to pray without ceasing. But if you want to honor God, give him the first. The first prayer of the day. The first part of your day. Before my feet even hit the floor out of the bed, I'm praying. I'm giving him the first. I mean, prayer is fun all day long, but there is just something special about that first part of the day. Uh, that, that's why we're going to dedicate the first 21 days of the new year to prayer and fasting. Uh, starting January 1st to January 21st, we're going to give God the first part of our year through prayer and fasting. Leviticus 27, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Now in our household, we take that literally about our money. I get paid every two weeks, and I mean, as soon as I get paid, uh, the first thing I do is tithe. 
First thing I do, if you look at my little Excel spreadsheet where I do my budget and pay my bills, the, you, you'd see that the first thing that goes out after the money comes in are my tithes and offerings to Rockbrook Church. I mean, it's just the first thing to go out is the tithe. Now, I know the government swoops in and takes the taxes out before I get it. I can't control that. But the first thing out that I can control is going to be uh, my tithe and offering. The significance is not just in the amount. It's also in the order. God gets his first. I don't pay everybody else and then see if there's any left over for God. No. Everybody else lines up behind God. And he gets his. And then they get theirs. The purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God in first place in your life. It's not just about the amount. It's about the order. Now, why is this so important? Because third principle, the first has the power to bless the rest. Remember, the clean thing has the power to redeem the rest. If you give God the first part of your day, God will take that part and use it to bless the rest of your day. If you give God the the, the first prayers uh, out of the day, God will take that prayer and bless all the other prayers you pray all day long. Same is true with your marriage, it's true with your kids, it's true with your work, it's true with your friendships, it's true with your projects, it's just true with every area in your life. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And acknowledge here doesn't mean you give Him kind of a head nod or a hap tip halfway through the day. No, you put Him first. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Now, if you see the principle of the first, if you see the principle of tithing as some sort of legalistic payment to God for services rendered, then you're missing the whole point of this teaching. And and there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, out there about this. Uh, Frankly, I think we've been spiritually deceived. Been spiritually deceived by the world, by our own flesh, and by the devil, in order to rob us of the power that can come into our life if we'll apply the principle of the first. God must be first. You must give God the first things. And when you do, God will bless you for it. So what do we do? What will I do in response to this teaching? And I'm going to give you three things, and I encourage every one of you to at least do the first one. And the first one is, do what I should do. Do what God says, do it God's way, and then see what happens. I mean, if you'll do what God says to do in Malachi 3, he says, bring the whole tithe. He tells us how much, he even tells us where to bring it. Into the storehouse, that's the place where you worship. Then there will be food in my house. Your your giving meets the practical needs of the church family. That's not even the motive. That's just one of the benefits. God says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And here's the motive. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. God says that if you will give the tithe, if you will give the tithe first, he's going to bless you for it. Now people will say, wait a minute, that's, that's Old Testament. That's Old Testament. Well, let me give you a New Testament verse, 1 Corinthians 6. Now about the collection for God's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. So Paul is teaching this to to the churches. It's a principle. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Now notice some things here. It happens on the first day. It's the principle of the first And notice that it's not a set amount, it's a percentage according to income. God is not looking for us all to give the same amount, but God is looking for us all to do the same thing. And that's the beauty of the tithe. If God set an amount, that amount might be impossible for some to give. I mean, what if God said, hey, you know, uh, you need to give $100,000? Well, that could be impossible. But with the tithe, it's possible for everybody. It's a percentage. 
You know, and then Paul says, if you do that, no collections will have to be made. The needs will be met, and when I show up, we're not going to have to do a building campaign. We're not going to have to do a fundraising drive. We're not going to have to put pressure on people. We're not going to have to make any awkward phone calls. You, know, you just teach people to honor God by putting Him first with the tithe, and the needs of the church are met, and the people get blessed by God. And so at Rockbrook, for 20 years, we don't do pledge cards, we haven't done building campaigns, we don't do bake sales or garage sales or car washes or sell light bulbs or make phone calls asking people for money. We just teach people to honor God with their first fruits and then let God bless, bless their socks off. Our needs are met and they get blessed. And to be honest with you, as a pastor, I don't police this process. I don't, I don't know what you give. I, I, don't, I don't look into that because I'm, I'm not interested in policing it. I'm just going to present the principle. You get to choose if you're going to be obedient or not. And if you choose to be obedient, God is going to bless you. And so that, that's what happens if I do what I should do. There's another level in your relationship with God. Number two, I do what I could do. And from time to time, if you're faithful with tithing, God is going to whisper in your ear and he'll say, hey, I, I want you to do a little more this time. I want, I want you to, to give over and above the tithe. And God will whisper to you and tell you to do that. And I want to encourage you to listen to God, don't listen to me. Don't listen to a man because a man will manipulate you. But listen to God. I mean, I try real hard as your pastor not to do this. That's why we don't do all the... A lot of stuff other churches do about money. The fundraising and the thermometer on the wall and the letters. And No, I want you to respond to God, not to me. Because from time to time, God's going to whisper. And God's going to say, I want you to make a sacrifice. Write that word down, a sacrifice. God's going to ask you, you know what? Instead of buying this, I want you to give it. Instead of doing that remodel, instead of upgrading that vehicle, instead of buying those new golf clubs, instead of getting that new sewing machine, instead of taking that vacation, I want you to sacrifice that and give it. And I'll bless you if you do. God says you don't have to, but you could. And so you do what you could do. Now these are offerings. They're not tithes. The tithe already belongs to God. This, the offering is something that's given over and above. And that's the concept for our celebration offering. And, you know, we're going to take that tonight at our night of worship. And we offer people the opportunity through the end of the year to just celebrate what God has done and to give over and above. And if God's telling you to do that, then do it. And if he's not, then don't. Okay? Don't do it because I'm telling you. Look what happens in 2 Corinthians 8. It says, They gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service. I mean, that's, that's a sacrificial offering over and above the tithe. Third level, and, and I'm excited to share this one with you because some of you are ready for this third level. And that's I do what I would do. I'm going to be obedient and tithe the first fruits to God faithfully. From time to time, I'm going to uh, listen to God's call to sacrifice and give more. And then, then this third level is where it gets to be fun. And this is where you say, God, if, if you want to use me, if you want to pour out some unexpected uh, income, some unexpected resources on me, I, I promise, I'll give it. I'll just be the channel. You bring it, I'll give it. I'll make a difference with it. Because God is looking for people to pour resources into. But he's looking for people that he can trust. Frankly, he's looking for people who've done what they should do, who've done what they could do, and are willing to do what they would do. 2 Corinthians 9, now he who supplies seed to the sower. Notice who he gives the seed to. He gives it to the sower. Not the storer, not the hoarder, not the keeper, not the squanderer, but the one who's going to use it to uh, make a difference. And bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that, here's the reason, you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. God is looking for some people just to pour out his blessing on. 
people who will do what they would do. And God does it sometime, but not necessarily all the time. You know, sometimes he'll pick out a faithful person and he'll just dump his blessing on them to see, see what they'll do with it. There, there was a season for Katie and I a, a few years ago when God, for some reason, just opened the floodgates of heaven. I mean, it was like money was falling out of the sky. I mean, I would run to the mailbox every day because there was money in it. I mean, it was just amazing. And I remember, you know, and God, we were just giving it. And I remember, you know, coming into the church office and writing checks. And uh, it, 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 we were giving like crazy. And about the third, fourth time that happened, I remember I came in and Bob Terry, our administrator, he was sitting there. And I remember he turned around in his chair and he just flat out said, Kelly, should you really be giving this much? And I think Bob thought I was robbing quick trips. <laughs> but, you know, God for that season was just pouring it on. So we could do what we would do. And then it just stopped. I mean, it just dried up. And I'm like... <laughs> and since then, it's been my... Per- God, if you want to do that again, that was fun. I'll, I'll do that. Man, it was great. And some of you, maybe it's time to do what you would do. And God will open the windows of heaven and bless you. But I invite you to, to lean into the principle of the first. Put God first in every area of your life. Do what you should do. Do what you could do. And do what you would do. Let's pray together. God, I just thank you that you are a generous and giving God, that that, that you willingly gave your firstborn son to redeem us. God, we were unclean, he was clean, and he was sacrificed that we might be saved. God, we thank you that that you give us the opportunity to enjoy your blessing by putting you first in every area of our lives. And if you're here today and you've, you've never made the decision, the salvation decision to trust in Christ and to put God first in your life, I pray you just make that decision in this moment. God, God offered Jesus to redeem you. And he invites you to, to decide to put him first in your life. Not second, third, not just on the list but to put him first. And maybe you're here and you've been a believer. You've been a believer for years and it's time for you to to put God first in every area of your life and to begin to offer to him the first fruits, the first fruits of your money, the first fruits of your marriage, the first fruits of your time, just the first things of your life to do what you should do, to do what you could do, do what you would do if God would bless you even more. Father, we thank you for the life, the money, and the hope that you offer us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.